So, first I want to touch on, I have not read any of the soap notes yet, because why would I do that? Um, I'll start grading those today. A couple things about the practical that I saw. We need to do a better job with good subjective conversations. I think there's a good... 85% failure to have a good subjective conversation with our patient. And I understand it's for the first practical. Everybody's nervous to just do their task and forget to actually interact like it's a patient. So um, in my yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, that we said practicals are a testing experience, but they're also a learning experience as well. So, hopefully, some of the learning experiences you get to talk to your patients like a person and you need information from them about pain, about their function, about anything else that they might uh, want to tell us that could shape our treatment or potentially lead us to a bigger problem that we have to address. And I think the other big thing was leaving our patients unattended, either sitting at the edge of the bed, I gotta go get the wheelchair, having the wheelchair out of your reach, like those kind of things. And that's the kind of stuff. And actually, I didn't uh, do big data analysis on this, so I might be wrong on this. I actually think people with tech experience did that more frequently than those who do not have tech experience. I think it's because in general, in the outpatient world, you work with patients who can be left alone, where if we're working on bed mobility and transfers, those patients should not be. Uh, they're at a high risk of, of problems. So other things for us to think about. But again, I mean, testing experiences and learning experiences, it is the same. I will also say when, when Brent said, you know, me talking to my patient kind of messed up my skills a little bit. I know you are really good at your skills when you can talk to your patient and have a conversation as you are measuring range of motion, as you are telling them about, oh, we're, that's a great story. We're going to get up now. Um, so I, I think some of that might be your intentional practice as well. So uh, not always, not always, but something for you to think of. All right, so the next phase, so we did our first exam was more hospital-based lab values and things like that, special equipment. Next phase was more skilled nursing facility. Uh, the next thing we're going to be talking about is the home now, home environment, and what skills and thought process issue we have with that. So First thing we'll talk about is the Americans with Disability Act. And um, the Americans with Disability Act in 1990 law uh, was designed to provide a national mandate to eliminate discrimination based on disability. It covers employment, public services, public accommodations. Those are hotels, restaurants, bars, public settings, um, telecommunications. And I always think if you're going to have a law, throw in a miscellaneous section. I got, how would you guys feel if I said, all right, the exam's on Thursday, we're going to cover wrists, spine, and miscellaneous. How would you? <laughs> I don't know, but hey. So, first we have to define what a disability is. So, a person that has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of a person and a record of such impairments. So the major life impairments include communications, working, walking, standing, lifting, bending, caring for yourself, thinking, sleeping, concentrating, eating, performing manual tasks. Physical impairment, uh, physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement, anatomical loss affecting one or more body systems, mental impairments, any mental or psychological disorder. Um, I'll say... I use cognition, and I, what I see in most tools and literature is talking about cognition for mental impairments. So those words are typically interchangeable. 
Um, disabilities can include cognitive limitations, organic brain syndrome, emotional or mental illness, specific learning disabilities, contagious and non-contagious diseases, orthopedic, visual, speech, hearing, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, cancer, MS, heart disease, diabetes, mental retardation, uh, emotional illness, HIV, drug addiction, alcoholism, does not include homosexual and bisexuality. So I left that in there and I cut and paste right from the text of the law. And so there's a couple words here that I think in today, in 2023, you look at and be like, oh, look at that. I think the homosexuality and bisexuality being considered as a disability is something that I think in 1990, and, and if the law was enacted in 1990, this law was being crafted years beforehand. So the late 80, mid to late 80s started this. And what's the other word that you look at that you say like, oh, boy, that word's out of date retardation right um where i mean i've seen pictures of you guys ever see the boot drives uh from uh fire departments usually muscle dystrophy so i saw i've seen pictures clearly in the 70s and 80s people holding uh you know similar boot drives can drives like to change and their their big uh neon vests say help retarded children and it's like well, those those are some of the best people in the world. They're dedicating their time and collecting money for people with special needs. So I left those terms in here. One, because I, I like to think like, geez, what were those conversations like? Like it, it, to me, it's just a little like time capsule or way back then. But also medical texts change slowly. So when we read our textbooks, when and especially next semester when we look at uh, pathophysiology, that course, those textbooks take decades to change the language of. So while we should be learning everything we possibly can, but also advocating for our patients in the best ways that we possibly can for them as well. And I think sometimes it can be hard to... I think some of those words, it's obvious where, like, obviously into 2023, how out of place they feel. And Marriage and Disabilities Act, coming from the core of it, good or not good? Yeah, I think the core of it is really good, trying to prevent discrimination on with people with disabilities. Like, the core of it is good. Um, with some kind of cringy little, oh, geez, I wish you could just uh, wipe that out, right? Um so I, I just think it's uh, interesting to think of um, and things that we still have to battle um, for our patients and advocate, not only maybe for our patients, but for ourselves as well. So anyway, so reasonable accommodations. So the it is expected for an employer to make reasonable accommodations for qualified individuals with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunity. Now, those workplace accommodations, it might include scheduling. So someone might say, listen, I, I it takes me a long time to get ready in the morning, greater than what most other people take. I, I need to start my day at 10 and not at 8.30 like the rest of the gang. Um, specific activities or requirements, maybe locations of jobs, modifications of the physical environment, I think that's a, well, we'll expand on that in a little bit. Different assistive devices, teletypewriter, telephone amplifier, large print manuals, maybe a modification of furniture, but easy ones, accessible restrooms, entrances, hallways, parking lots, things like that. Now, what's not expected is uh, for the employer to have an undue burden. And I think that's a problem in this Northeast that we have because we have really old buildings with witch stairs. So um, it is not up to the employer to say, it's going to cost me 500 grand to modify this old building that I've got. Well, that's an undue burden. But having a chair that can be used, a, a, a sit-to-stand desk that can change heights to accommodate to a person, um, all of those things are reasonable. So I know in uh, in the other classrooms that I teach at, at different campuses, there's always a disability services desk and chair in every single classroom. Do you guys 
when you take other classes in other, and we're just in this room so much that it's hard to remember any other room. Um, do you guys remember seeing any of those? No. Um, so I know at, at CCRI we have things like that. So public entity must modify policies, practice, procedures to avoid discrimination, unless the modification would fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activities. That's kind of what I just was looking to the, the undue burden. And it's the undue bur burden is determined on a case by case basis. You can't just say, no, undue burden, right? It is a process you have to go through. So, one of the reasons why this is so important is we will be called upon to help not only our patients return to work. I think that's one that we see often. We might be called upon to <laughs> brainstorm for workplaces. What can we do to make this better for our employees? I know I've had patients that have acquired some sort of disease or disability and they decided to move houses. They say, okay, this house won't work for us anymore. Let's move to a different house. And I've been um, helping that person help modify what the next home, these are the features that should it have. Obviously in the home care world, I modify homes all the time. So uh, this is definitely something that we will be participating in in our careers so residents workplace community interviews with patient family employer pictures measurements of environments are always going to help recommendations on what to improve uh there are specific features for a wheelchair accessible home on in your textbook we'll look at wheelchairs just a little bit but in general the home specifications and this is the slide that we really need to worry about. There's a million different codes and, and recommendations. This is the big slide of the information for us. Uh, so door width, 32 inches minimum, 36 inches preferred, and clearance to open and enter. So that's another thing like we have to figure out, okay, well, how will this door swing open? Which direction will it swing open? How is this? That, that is another piece of it. It's not just the width. It's easy to think of the width, but then also how does the door fit? Uh, pocket doors, you guys know what those are? Those are awesome. They slide into the wall. Yeah, yeah those are the best. Um, those are really good because they can serve on space. Threshold height, so that's the transitions in between rooms. Um Typically, the ones from the exterior home to the interior home are the biggest ones. Um, so, less than a half an inch. Why is that important? Why do you think that? So, a wheelchair getting up and over that, that um, can be really difficult. Floor surface, firm, slip resistant, half inch or less pile of carpeted with firm underlay. Anybody ever propel a wheelchair? Do we have any carpets in, can you think of any carpets anywhere in this building? Yeah. All right. So when we play with carpets, even on like the high traffic carpet, I want you to roll on this type of floor and then propel yourself on a, a carpet, a high traffic carpet. And then just think the plush carpeting that can exist in homes, well, how difficult that can be. Uh, door handles, 36 inches from the floor with a lever type handle. Lever type's infinitely easier to open than the knob type. Ramps have to be between 36 and 48 inches wide. Here's the really important thing. One inch rise for every 12 inch run. I think we talked about this before, right? So that ramp gets long quick. So a typical stair height is how many inches? Between six and eight inches. So we need between a six and eight foot length ramp for every stair that it takes to get into the house. So a lot of real estate. And I actually had a patient just the other day. 
he's got a long-term disability. They're looking into ramps and they don't have the amount of space in, in their front door. Their, their front door is close to the sidewalk and it's close to the driveway. They can't configure a ramp that will work there. So they have to figure out, okay, well, the back door is only two steps and we, we can take up that section of the driveway for that. So it is not easy. And, and uh, it's definitely something that is a huge obstacle for most of our patients that need to go home with wheelchairs is that the thought is, well, we'll just get a ramp. All right, well, hold on. This is now a thing. Like, we've got to really think about this. Um, so that's the big thing, the the slope, one-inch rise, 12-inch run. Really important because as we ascend the ramp, if it's steeper than that, it's really difficult. And as we descend, it's really difficult to control the speed. And also, the deeper that pitch, the more likely it is for that person to fly out the front. So that is a really tough thing. Ramps longer than 30 feet will need some sort of change in direction for energy conservation um, and to uh, just for safety. All right, 30 feet. Give me how many steps, roughly, that would be if it's a eight-inch step. Who can do the math? How many steps is that? Five steps if it's a six-inch step. So, um, you know, so most ramps are probably going to require some sort of change in direction just because of that. The landing area must be five feet by five feet as well. So um, that's top, bottom, and any change of directions. The reach zone is from 20 inches to the floor, uh, off the floor, so uh, measure 20 inches high, and then up to 48 inches from the floor. Because if you're sitting in a wheelchair, it's really hard to reach down to the ground, and especially that's now a, a falling out of the wheelchair problem for reaching that low, and reaching high is the more obvious one why that would be a problem. Oh, Yep. I do burdens. I'm sure that if there's an apartment complex without some sort of uh, ramp or anything like that, I'm sure that it falls under the undue burden uh, piece of it. Um, I would wonder when it was built. That's what I'm confused. <laughs> well, I mean, buildings can look new, but yeah. be built, so it's not. Um, so I wonder if that's part of it. Sometimes there's a rickety elevator somewhere in the recesses of the building somewhere that no one would ever use or want to use because it's it, – it's, uh, it, yeah, yeah. Anybody ever been in the elevator with a gate and not the uh, door? Those are always fun. Uh, so I wonder if there might be something that gets away with with that that you would never actually know over or use. Um, so, uh, kitchen thirty two to the sink height, thirty two to thirty four inches from the floor, with an open front. And well insulated or shielded plumbing. Why is that so important? So we don't when when the, our legs are underneath the counter, we don't burn our legs or hit them and in, into the hard objects. Uh, toilet eighteen inches from the floor, three foot space needed in the front and one side for a wheelchair clearance. Um, thirty safety bars thirty. 24 to 30 inches long exact height is going to be within the reach home zone. So we have some wiggle room with that and we can be patient specific for that. Um, but attached to studs or reinforced to the floor. And then the bed height, 18 to 22 inches. Why do you think the bed height and the toilet height is so specific? Transfers on and off. And I get when we, pull out the wheelchairs in a little bit, you can measure, okay, how high is this seat from the ground? Um, how come the bed can be higher than the toilet? 
Yeah, once we're sitting on, if you got a 22 inch bed, once you're sitting on it, it's going to compress. So. So there are more that we can look at. I don't expect you to know the rest of them. There are resources for you um, that you can look at. But I would ask you that you know the important ones. That's why I put important home specifications. All right. Um, there's our quick review for that. Any questions? We are going to roll right into wheelchairs. On the ADA, that important slide, you know, important measurements to know, gravitate measure and measure your house. Because you can stare at flashcards, you can stare at the slide all you want, measure your house. That that will sink in the, the measurements into your brain way more when you can see how high an 18-inch toilet is and compare it to what you've got. Um, when you can see how high the countertop is, like that is the best way to remember these things is to, to do it in your own home. All right. So wheelchair fitting, uh, we are going to give a broad overview for wheelchair fitting. More in depth is it could be a whole career for you. Wheelchair fitting could be a whole separate career. There is so much intricacy to it, and there is such expertise to what is the best wheelchair for this person, how do we appropriately fit it, and they're also really expensive. So that, you know, being able to, some wheelchairs cost more than what cars cost now. Um, it, it really can be uh, quite expensive. So... <clears throat> We're going to give some broad overviews. At this point, you're, if you wanted to be that wheelchair expert, like you can go through a certification program, become a wheelchair uh, fitter, and, and that could be your whole career. And I, I think that's a pretty fun career too. Um, but we're going to give some broad overview because a lot of times patients will be coming to us with wheelchairs. I have patients buying wheelchairs or getting them from – more often, I get patients getting wheelchairs from secondhand places, uh, Shriners, uh, Mason's Lodge. They're, they're, you know, they're, hey, we've got this broken leg. You're supposed to be non-wayfaring for 12 weeks. We got this wheelchair. This is the one we found. Um, so a lot of times, we're going to have to educate our patients on how to best uh, fit them, what things are a problem, and how we can improve upon that. But a person who uses a wheelchair as primary role of mobility should have a chair that provides maximal function, comfort, stability, safety, and protection of bodily structures. There are a bunch of different types of wheelchairs. Um, it, has anybody ever seen the uh, sports-related wheelchairs, basketball, rugby? I mean, there's uh, speed, like racing wheelchair, like really amazing technology completely different design than what a standard wheelchair that's going to be good for most other activities you wouldn't get what's what are some of the features of those uh let's think of the racing wheelchairs the wheels are really like uh, wheel, so the wheels are really they're they're uh tilted because the less contact of the ground with the tire reduces friction, which if you want to go fast, that's what you want. So that's why they're 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 angled to that. Um, what else? What other features? That's the big one. Yep. Yep. What's that? Really light, super light, as light as possible. Same reasons. Less weight. These less I have to 
push, right? Anything else? So there's the yeah, and that goes with uh, decreasing the weight. So there's no push handles for it. It's it's yeah, we take away anything else that the person needs or that doesn't need. Uh, I think in general they're really long too. Um, super tight, as tight as possible. Yeah, to the patient. So really narrow in the seats, but wider at the tires. So all of those features are designed for specific function. Can, do you think that wheelchair would be really good for wheeling around here, tight spaces, corners? No, it's way too wide. Uh, and as we get into this a little bit more, we have some concern like, okay, if you wanna be in that chair for a race for a couple of hours, that's okay. But if you're gonna be in it for, long, for days on end, we have some serious concerns of pressure, and skin breakdown and other areas because of that. So again, it's a balance between all of these things. So at first we're gonna have careful measurements and then we're gonna confirm fit as the patient adapts, grows, regresses. I think the confirmation of fit is something that we're gonna be seeing a lot more often. I'll be working with a patient who's been using a wheelchair for five years. The fit five years ago was a lot different than it is now because now the person has had five years of potentially a sedentary lifestyle. Now their patient's body is a lot different than it was five years ago. So, um, and because they're so expensive, these wheelchairs, it's hard to get insurances to pay for them. And it's hard to convince most other people to say, hey, you need to find some money for this. So we'll be looking at that. We're going to be talking mostly about standard wheelchairs, not expanding into sport-specific equipment or special adaptations for other special needs. Some other types of wheelchairs are listed in your book. Um, just this week, I've had two patients with just amazing wheelchairs uh, with them. Um, really some incredible stuff. And if you work in pediatrics, you see some amazing uh, technology and fit for that. Three people, three people with wheelchairs, with advanced wheelchairs this week. Yep. The technology of, of some of that stuff and, and how the they enhance life because that's what our whole job is, right? Is enhancing life, the quality of life and, and um, optimizing the human experience is, is what well, us at, as in the physical therapy world is all about. So uh, seeing the technology and how it interacts with the person and is just amazing. So, the selection of the proper wheelchair and can, its components includes what the patient impairments and activity limitations and restrictions are, the safety judgment, patient size, age, weight, functional skills and preference, and then the portability and accessibility is another thing. Um, do you know what you just said you saw pediatric patient with a pretty fancy it's a sit to stand wheelchair incredible right how do they get to and from the clinic okay does the wheelchair go back and forth with the family does it fit in their vehicle okay because that's not the case. If we think of like our standard wheelchairs that we'll be playing with, can be folded up and thrown in the back seat. Once you put a motor on a wheelchair, now they weigh several hundred pounds. Um, and you can't lift that into a car. It doesn't fit. So now you need some sort of a, a hitch and um, freight system that you can drive up Put it on the back of the car so it's 
it's easy to just to say like, oh, we'll just put a motor on it. Well, all right, but it's not. That's not just it. And actually, once we start getting into all the specific measurements, you'll see how one little decision can make a chain reaction to every single other thing. So it is not easy. Um, so here's some a diagram of uh, the wheelchair on the ground. All right, so we've got our wheelchair here. So So here are our armrests. These are removable. You press the little push bins to remove them. I think we've all played with that. One of our wheelchairs has a flip. It just flips out of the way. You guys, what, did you guys come across that one yet? Um, this is the clothing guard. I don't know what happened on this clothing guard. Um, actually, I, I will say, this is the kind of wheelchair that my patients grab from the secondhand recyclers. Like, it's fine, but, you know, so being able to identify what the problems are, maybe they can go back and get a different one, or how do we, how do we educate our patients? So even without thinking of this, we've got a clothing guard that's missing on this side, not on this side. If this is the best my patient can do, what do you think we educate our patient on? Well, first of all, what do you think the purpose of a clothing guard is? Keep the clothes from getting caught in the wheels. If this is the best we've got, come up with a couple solutions. Don't wear baggy clothing. I think it's first off, don't wear baggy clothing. Can't wear it because man, not a bad idea. Grab an old t-shirt, wrap it right around there. That way there is some sort of barrier there. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um yeah, and there might be other objects. Could you grab cardboard and zip ties and create your own, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> something. So, armrest, clothing guard. Um, the front rigging are the leg rests. Complete with foot plate. Um, this is the... Yeah, what we call this pad. Um, but I will show you. So this is the right leg, the wheelchair. There's a little release lever here. So you put the spokes in, and then you get to swing that. And now it's locked in place. If you want to just swing that out of the way, you just press that release. Uh, this, you're able to adjust the height. Of the leg rest too. Not all. Some of them are fixed. Others are adjustable like this. Uh, this doesn't have it, but a heel loop. We don't have a picture of the heel loop either. You'll see some of those. That's just a little piece of fabric in the back to keep the foot from sliding backwards off of that. Caster wheel is the front wheel. Drive wheel is the back wheel. And this piece is the hand rim. The brakes, wheel locks, back upholstery, push handles, and these are our tip bars. We've used our tip bars before. Some have anti-tip bars where that this tip bar, instead of going straight out, 
it's kind of angled down with usually little uh, little plastic wheels to it too, to prevent the person from tipping all the way backwards. Um, I've never seen drag racing cars with the, with the little wheels in the back that prevent it, same thing. Not quite as fast with these. That'd be fun. How do we do that? Let's do it. So that's the broad anatomy of the wheelchair. We're going to dive into a whole lot more with it. So seating and positioning, proper positioning should promote function, prevent deformity, improve body alignment, prevent tissue damage, and prevent additional complications. <clears throat> you can always add more supports. So you might have to have headrests, uh, lack of trunk supports, um, you know, a little padding that just, uh, if a person tries to lean to that side, it gives them that that prevention for doing so. Seat pan, cushion, back uh, panel, armrest, troughs. Those are cool. I think we have an armrest trough. An uh, armrest trough is just for, so the person doesn't slide off of the armrest. It's, it's a literal trough that just fits right in. Um, just a quick note, these armrests are desk cutout armrests. That makes it way easier to wheel up and get close to any sort of desk where if it extended the full length, we would always be a little ways away. So really good for somebody who has a lot of desk activities for school, for eating, for socializing. Um, what do you think the downside though is? Less support. Um, a big one is it gives us less places to put our hands for the sit to stand transfer. We don't have that. I mean, th those are right here is a perfect place to put our hands to help us push up. So, okay. Everything has to be balanced, right? So yes, it's good. If we add this, it's bad. If we add that, which one's more important, can we get away with the bad? Is that going to be that bad? Can we work on it? So again, the, there's so much, you make one little change, there's so many other things we have to think about with this. And that's our that's our job to educate our patients and their families on because they're not thinking about that. They're just thinking, hey, how do we get seated closer to the table for dinner? Um, so other evaluation of the wheelchair user, sitting balance, stability, reaching ability, what method of propulsion we're going to use. These are manual. Um, we could have power or there's something called power assist where the patient will propel grabbing the hand rims and driving and um, the wheelchair kicks on 20%. So it's, it's both people are using the oh, wheelchair side person. <laughs> uh, the person is still using it and the wheelchair is just helping that person along the way. Those are pretty cool. Um, what kind of transfer methods are we going to be using? What's the ability to change positions? What about the sitting posture? All of it is really important to figure out. Desirable posture minimizes energy expenditure, promotes function, decreases discomfort, and maintains trunk stability. Seat types. These are slim types or hammock types. Problem with it is they tend to cause hip internal rotation as we sit on that. A posterior pelvic tilt will lead to a forward head, tendency of pelvis to slide forward and makes lateral scoot transfers. What's a lateral scoot transfer? It's a slide board that we used, right? So this, the lateral scoot is, it includes slide board transfers, but it's also, it's the same it's the same transfer just without a slide board. So our patients who are going to be using that method for transfers, they're going to get really good at it where they, they're going to do a slide board transfer without a slide. Board. They're going to be able to get in and out of the car without a slide. That's the lateral scoot transfer. So these sling types, a little bit more challenging to perform those kind of 
transfers. So we could add a cushion, which is good because that eliminates some of the negative outcomes versus the sling type. However, makes the patient difficult to fit underneath tables. Why? We're up a few inches more. Um, limits the ability to use armrests and back support. Can also change position of the legs. What type of cushion is now also something that we have to consider. There's different uh, foam and, and air cushions. The air cushions are inflatable, which is really nice. They're light, but they're big, bulky. Uh, gel is a common one, which are heavier and also bulky. We talked about if our patient's incontinent, not having foam cushions is really important. So um, let's do this. Let's take a 10 minute walking break. We're going to come back and we're going to learn how to measure for wheelchairs and then confirm fit for wheelchairs. Okay. So let's take a quick 10 minute break. All right. So first up, we're going to say, okay, ideally, if you were to say, okay, we need to order a wheelchair, how are we going to measure that person and give those measurements to the vendor to then give us the right wheelchair? So that's our first step. So the textbook says put a person on a firm surface like a piece of plywood, which, yeah, patient comfort wise, I don't know about that. But what we don't want is to have a really cushioned couch or bed that now the patient's sinking in, it could alter some of our measurements. So uh, we'll do it with our tables that we have here. So let's uh all right let's just good all right so first up seat height we're going to measure patient's heel to popliteal fold and then we'll add two inches so we'll measure Right from his heel, we have the shoes off heel, the popliteal fold. That is 19 inches on the dot. Add two inches, it's what? 21 inches, so the C height, 21 inches. Unless we're gonna add a cushion. If we are gonna add a cushion, we don't add the two inches. Because now that person is what, way too high? So again, part of the thought process, and this is, you'll see very quickly how one little change can make a whole lot of other problems along the way. So that's how to measure C height, leg length. Um, once we have the patient in the chair, foot plate should be at least two inches from the floor for clearance. So when the, we have everything set up, we'll be able to measure, make sure we have that clearance of the foot rest. Uh, seat depth. That is the seat this way into your posterior. We're going to measure uh, patient's posterior buttock along lateral thigh to popliteal fold, then subtract two inches. So from here to here, 23 minus two is 21. Why are we going to subtract those two inches for that step? Exactly, because what we don't want is we don't want the edge of the seat digging into the popliteal space, causing potential for skin breakdown. We want a little bit of clearance. All right, so that was seat depth, seat width, measuring widest parts of patient's buttocks, hips, or thighs, and add 1.5 inches. So. Wherever you visually see the widest spot, there to there. 15, add 1.5. That gives how much space on either side? Three quarters of an inch on either side. Um, why is that so important? 
really making sure that your greater trochanters aren't in prolonged contact with that. Also gives some room for clothing to also not be in contact too. Um, back height, we're gonna measure from the seat of the chair to the floor of the axilla. Arm abducted 90 degrees. So from seat to the floor of the axilla. 16 inches, but we're going to subtract four inches from that. Why? Yeah. We want to make sure that back height, we want it to be below, and with the top of the seat height to be below the scapula for, again, prevention of the down. Um, if we add a cushion to that, boy, we've got to start figuring out what to do for that back height now, right? Um. And then arm rest height measure from the seat of the chair to the electron process with the elbow flex 90. So here to there is seven inches. And then add one inch. So that would make it eight inches. So that's because why do you think that is important? because we want it to be slightly higher so that the patient's not leaning down to rest their arms on. So we can have maintain our vertical trunk that just a little bit higher. Um, and again, we'll be affected. Now we have adult norms with that as well. Um, so those will be things that you'll need to put in memory at some point. So. Why don't we take some time? Let's run through all these measurements with other people and then we'll break out some wheelchairs, okay? Thank you, Eddie. All right, not bad, right? So obviously this is the kind of thing where we would say, okay, this patient will need a wheelchair. Let me do some measurements so we can get the right one. Now getting the right one could be purchasing them directly from somewhere. Could be, hey, when you go to the Shriners, here's the tape measure. The most important thing is this C height or the back height, or, you know, with your patient, you'd be able to figure that out. Um, or, you know, you might be in the hospital, skilled nursing facility setting and say, okay, this person is going to go home with a wheelchair. I'm going to order one that is this size. So that, that would be the three major ways we're going to do that. But, a lot of times, my patients um, have had a wheelchair for years, and now I just need to make sure it does fit. Or someone who doesn't know what they're doing gave them that wheelchair, and we say, well, why did you give them this one? They said, well, because it was in the closet. And they need one, and that one's a wheelchair. So uh, the confirmation of fit is what we'll do more. I've done more confirmation of fitting and then trying to adjust after the fact, then I have actually, okay, we need to get one, let's make sure it's sized appropriately. Um, so, we do now, would you mind hopping in this? In there. All right. All right, so let's say our patient came to us already there with the uh, wheelchair in, had this for years. We need to make sure it's still fitting because especially in pediatrics, what's going to happen in pediatrics? They're going to grow. What happens as we age and our diet and activity level doesn't change to keep up with us? What do we do? We grow. <laughs> And, and sometimes the opposite can happen as well. I've had patients lose a lot of body mass over years because um, especially if they have to use a wheelchair for locomotion, how hard is it to do the lateral scoot transfers if you weigh 50 pounds excess? Really difficult. So sometimes it's that motivation to say, if I want to get in and out of the car, I've got to drop a bunch of weight so I can actually do this for the next 20 years of my life. So, um, so sometimes it can happen the opposite way too. So confirmation of fitting, 
First up, seat height and leg length. First up, two inch clearance from the floor. Bottom of the floor. Bottom of the footrest to the floor. No, no, that's the floor. Yeah, we gotta go bottom. Of it. <laughs> uh, the other seat height and leg length. So I want two to fit two to three finger breaths um, underneath the patient's thigh from the front seat edge. So that's here. So I don't want to have contact. I want to be able to have him um, right there. Seat depth, two to three fingers from the front edge to the seat to the popliteal fold. That's now here. Seat width, hand plays vertically, fits between the greater trochanters and the side panels. So I'm going to be not like collapsing on top. I'm trying to give you guys a view, but that's where my hand can be there. Back height. Four finger height from the back upholstery to the patient's axilla. So that would be here to here. Four fingers there. About one finger breadth from the back upholstery to the inferior angle of the scapula. So I can then palpate and say, okay, that fits about there. And then armrest, shoulders should be level, not way up high in the shoulders and not way down either. And the trunk should be erect. If the, um, the armrests were too low and he would have to lean way forward to be in contact with it, now the trunk's not erect either, right? So that's my confirmation of fit. I go through those steps. So, um, what we have Jen, pretty good. It's actually, I mean, for gra just grabbing him and grabbing the first wheelchair out of there, it's pretty good. I'm a little concerned with the axilla. That's the one that I thought was the tightest, but everything else pretty good um so what we're gonna do next is gonna get crowded in here quick so feel free to stay in there with the wheelchairs but we're gonna grab a wheelchair we got to try to find the appropriate leg rigging um and i want you to put someone in it and go through the steps of confirmation of fit we'll do that um so practice i mean we have to put the leg rests on practice taking them off practice with the hand brakes practice with all that kind of mechanical stuff Practice with the armrest. We've done the armrest a little bit, but play with the wheelchairs for a while and then also confirmation of fit, okay? All right, let's have fun. So the seat height and leg length, that first one, two to three finger length under patient's thigh from seat edge versus seat depth. Uh, there's a really nice picture on page, what page is it on? I was feeling your book. 137, um, and which edition is that? 138, which edition is that? I think that's the sixth edition you guys have. So if your edition is different than the sixth, it might be on a different page, but there's a really nice picture of it. And that first one, C height leg length, that is the distal hamstring not being in contact with the, the chair, the seat of the chair. Um, and it's your fingers laid flat across this way to so that. Okay, that's the first one, seat height and leg length. Seat depth, two to three fingers from the front edge to the popliteal fold. That is staying away from no contact with the gastrox now. So the top one is hamstring, other one's gastrox. That's the easier way to think. All right, so... <laughs> So the next thing we want to talk about is the the problems if we if we um, have a poorly fit wheelchair. The problems are going to range uh, are either going to cause biomechanical changes, uh, potential for skin breakdown, and then functioning in the environment. So if the seat height is too high. Now we're not going to have adequate trunk support because now the upholstery is going to be too low, right? So if you added a big cushion to me here, I'm way high and I won't have enough support in my back for that. Um, 
I will also, it's easy to see how that would have difficulty uh, fitting underneath tables if my seat was way too high. Difficulty propelling because I can't reach the hand rims and get a, a, a nice push with that. Also, we'll look at some propulsion techniques where we use our feet as well. Anybody ever see somebody propel their wheelchairs with feet? If you go into a, a rehab nursing home, you'll see that almost exclusively. Just go waters around. Uh, but if my seat height is too high and if I can't come in contact with the ground, I can't use my feet to propel. Um, and then also now I would also have poor posture because my forearms can't come in contact with the armrest. I'd have to now lean way forward for it. So it's a whole bunch of problems with that. If the CI is too low, number one, that's going to be harder to transfer in and out of. That's I think that's been easy for us to see, especially when we were going from wheelchair to plinth, how it was tough to go uphill for that lateral scooter slide board. Um, well, if this, if the, your wheelchair is too low, every transfer is now difficult. Um, if the CI is too low, but the re leg rests are adequate, what that's going to do is that's going to raise the level of my knees, which is doing what? Well, I think we had just talked about it. Now we're shifting all my body weight directly onto the issue of tuberosities, which what's the number one skin breakdown part for someone with who uses a wheelchair for locomotion is issue of tubes, right? So now we're making a big problem way worse. Length, length if the foot rests are too low, well, we're going to have pressure on the distal posterior aspect of the um thigh in contact with the, the seat. Decrease function of the upper extremities to, uh, because of poor posture now, so we have difficulty to propel. And then safety concerns with clearance of the floor. I don't want to be ramming into those transitions, especially if it's at speed. That would be a huge problem if I'm actually going any speed and then I hit a uh, stable object, I could be pitched out. <laughs> if it's too high, increase... Uh, pressure on just uh, issue of tuberosities, like we just talked about, difficulty fitting under table, and also uh, decreased trunk stability due to lack of support as well. C, depth, if it's too short, I'm going to decrease my trunk stability, right? So I'm decreasing my base of support. So decrease, that equals decreased stability. Increased weight bearing on issue of tuberosities, and then poor sitting balance. Um, if it's too long, increased pressure of popliteal space, potentially increasing the risk of skin breakdown. Now, even though like there's not a bony prominence there, but it is still an area of high friction, so that would be a problem. See? Eat with next. So if if it's too wide, anybody have a wheelchair that was too wide for them? I think the, the ladies said it was too – the width was okay. Is everything else that was a problem? But if we did have one that was too wide, you could see how hard it would be to grab the hand rims and actually propel that way. So um, that would be a real big problem. Difficulty with lateral transfers. We're just increasing the distance that they would have to move at that point, which makes it harder. <laughs> Difficulty fitting through narrow – doors and hallways, uh, and then partial deviations because if it's too wide, what the person would probably do is lean to one side to catch that support somehow. So now they're always leaning towards their right. Now we're going to create postural deformities because of that. Um, if it's too narrow, difficulty changing positions because we don't have enough space to shift around at all. Uh, now, big problem, pressure at the side panels at the greater trochanter. That's probably what I'm most concerned with. Um, and then also, if you have any orthotics or really just bulky clothing, and in the colder climates, the big heavy jacket, you got to be able to wear it. So, Back height, <laughs> if it's too high, difficulty propelling because our arms, we can't use our arms comfortably to actually get in a good position for that propulsion. Increased pressure and skin breakdown at the scapula. And the 
what can happen is the patient can feel inclined to lean forward away from it, especially if it's really high, they want to get pressure off their scapulas. Now there's a balance issue because we're not in contact. Um, if it's too low, decreased trunk support stability and other postural deviations might pop up. Armrests, difficulty if they're too high, difficulty propelling, you know, you have to get up and over that armrest to then try to grab the hand ribs. Difficulty performing the transfers because of the push off face. So, you know, if it's If they're way too high, I'm at a mechanical disadvantage, right? I'm not my strongest wear in all my muscles or at strongest wear mid range, right? So if I'm, if it's way high, I'm nowhere near mid range for that. Um, postural deviations with elevated shoulders. Now I don't want to be up like this. Um, and then also decreased use of armrests just because it's tiring, um, which causes more trunk fatigue. If it's too low, excessive forward flexion to come in contact with those lower armrests, abdominal discomfort, inadequate balance. And now also if their armrests are too low, I can't push up because I'm not at mid-range either. So. so some family education we have to do for our patients. One, frequent skin and inspections has to be part of the things that we have to educate our, our patient and families about. Specifically, what areas are you most concerned with when we have someone with a wheelchair? The number one is ischial tubes. Give me some other. What are the two, three, four? Probably greater trochanters. And then what else? I heard scapula. Yep, scapula I think is probably the next one. Any others? Alecranons and maybe popliteal space. Spinous processes. Yep. Yep. Now, if it's a well fit wheelchair, I'm less concerned with the spinous scapula, less concerned with the popliteal space. You know, you always have to check everything, but it's probably, you know, issue tubes are always going to be a problem. Sacrum and then uh, spinous processes, alecranons, those are the ones we're always going to be worried about, whether it's well fit or not. Um, Pressure relief activities every 15 minutes if we're in the chair. So pressure relief activities are as simple as do a chair push up, get your release some pressure, then just sit on back down, right? So every 15 minutes doing something like that. Um, that's the sitting push ups, but even just reminding ourselves to shift, especially if someone using a wheelchair, they potentially have a higher risk of decreased sensation. Not because the wheelchair will call us decreased sensation. They have a condition that decreases their sensation. Um, so potentially. Um, and some users might need to be out of their chair from one to four hours at a time. Um, you know, we might have to be aggressive in getting our patients out of these chairs, which huge problem. If we develop an issue too, what, what, what kind of life does that person who uses the wheelchair for locomotion now have? We, now we can't, you you are, you have to go lay down in bed for a few weeks until this heals, you know, and it's a real, real problem. So uh, prevention of that is so important. Um, so we could also look at signs and symptoms of decreased circulation, looking, you know, see triple T me, teaching our patient about that, looking for edema, looking for color, um, decreased sensory response and loss of hair follicles. That could be another sign of you know, decreased hair in the legs, um, sign of impaired circulation. <clears throat> so uh, prevention of this secondary issue is more important than the patient's desire to sit in the wheelchair. Um, and we could also potentially teach our patients evaluation of femoral, popliteal, and pedal sites. I have a hard time thinking most of our patients' family members will be not only... Uh, it's a tough skill to teach. Now, how easy is it for us to palpate different pulses? How easy is it for us to palpate pedal, uh, both pedal and popliteal pulses? It takes a lot of work, right? So um, we could go ahead and think about it. I, I, that's the kind of thing I would say, listen, I'm gonna show this to you, but I don't expect big success. Call me anytime to figure this out. So, um, 
Well, why don't we uh, take another 10 minute break here? Then we'll talk about some other modifications and other wheelchair components after that, okay? 10 minutes. All right, so uh, we'll talk about some other aspects of wheelchairs. And again, I mean, today is an introduction to wheelchairs, basic measurements, basic confirmation of fits, but wheelchairs get complicated really quick. Um, I think that's some of the cool stuff about wheelchairs too. Yeah, you guys ever see the wheelchairs that can go upstairs? Yeah. It's got, it's got, um, I forget if it's got two or three tires on the back and it, it can wheel upstairs. I'll try to find a video of it. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, there are some wheelchairs that also change heights. So one of the problems with being in a wheelchair is you're always lower than everybody else. And there's some that you press a button and it raises you up to eye level with the rest of the world too. So, um, you know, the wheelchairs can be complicated really quick and they're really fascinating. But let's talk about some basic components. So armrests, um, I think one of the wheelchairs has fixed armrests. Did anybody come across that one? So some of the armrests can't be removed. Um, others are removable. Um, we have one wheelchair where it's the flip back version. The others, you have to press both of them to come on up. Uh, why would you choose the flip back versus the, you know, both push pins? What's the advantage of that flip back? You're not going to lose it. Not going to lose it. Yeah. What is it? It's always right there. It's easier, right? Press a little button, flip it back, lateral scoop, flip it back down, you're good to go. Um, this is a lot more difficult. So if you are going to be performing a lot of transfers, the flip back's way better. Um, we talked about the desk cutout. This is the desk cutout. Some of them are also adjustable. We talked about earlier the trough, too, if you needed to have your arm in a trough so it doesn't slide off. Um, casters, front wheels are typically between five and eight inches in diameter, could be solid or air-filled. I see solid. I don't really see air-filled at all. Um, yeah. Yep. One more thing to go wrong. I think I think when we for all of these things, one more thing to go wrong is part of the equation. Um, but if you're traveling on uneven ground, it, it, having air filled helps out considerably with that. So um, yeah, really specific to the patient. Um, Drive wheels could be air filled or solid. Uh, hand rims could be molded to the rim wheel or separate from the rim itself. Um, or you could also have a one arm drive chair, which for patients who only have one arm and no leg function, here's a one arm drive where you know this could be left or right. But you see how they have two hand rims here. The two separate ones on that side is the one. So this hand, you can grab both rims, and if you grab both rims and push forward, it propels both wheels. And I don't know. I think the outer rim controls that opposite side, and the inner rim controls this side. So with one hand, you can propel both wheels. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so different wheel locks, toggle locks, that's what all, we've, I don't think we have any other types. We have the toggle locks, that's for the brakes. Um, we could have Z or scissors locks. Um, there might be locks for some chairs can recline and you'd want there to be a lock to prevent it from reclining as well. Uh, I haven't seen these, but caster locks, you could have a caster lock to prevent the casters from pivoting. Um, <laughs> what I do use a lot, anybody who has their sitting in the chair, try to put the brake on and off. How many people had heart, 
trouble like actually locking them into place. So that happens quite a bit. Um, there are brake handle extenders, which all it does is it just takes, you just pop this little piece of rubber off, pop this little piece of rubber off, and then it's just a metal bar that just makes it longer and it increases the lever arm and it's, it's way easier than that. Um, so that's a common problem that we can improve upon. Um, different front rigging, fixed. I don't think we have any fixed in here. All of these are swing away or removable. I will warn you, anytime I've tried to do anything with a patient and I've swung the leg rigging away instead of removing it completely, it always ends up bad. I end up with a bruise in my shin. The patient ends up with a bruise in the shin. Like something always goes wrong. Take that extra step to remove it. It's never gone well for me. Um, elevating. And, you know, we've had some of these are adjustable, right? So this can be adjusted, different heights to it. Uh, others cannot. Um, safety belts. I don't think any of our wheelchairs have safety belts. But it can be very important. And again, the safety belt is for posture and safety, not to restrain the patient. That's where we have to draw the line. Is that all on um, pediatrics? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think of yeah, this week I've had three people with wheelchairs and all three of them have safety belts with it. Um, these standard wheelchairs typically do not, but the more custom and motorized, they will have it. Um, there's some features that you would want one in it, especially one that tilts in place. Uh, you'd want some safety harness for it, whether it's a lap bar or a, a chest support. <clears throat> but the more dependent the patient, the more we need to secure the patient inside, keep them inside of the wheelchair. Um, and some wheelchairs are reclining. Some are, can be semi-reclining and others can be fully reclining. If they're going to be fully reclining, we also have to have a headrest with that as well. You can tell here I'm not. Head would fall off pretty quickly. You could have an external power for it, um, sport, lightweight or ultra lightweight, folding, transport wheelchairs. There's a million different types of uh, wheelchairs out there that we could look at. But really important to understand the operation of the brakes, I think, is the one of the most important things. Like the pressure relief is probably the most important. And then number two is safe operation of the brakes. Anytime that the, the patient is still, we should be locking the brakes. Anytime the patient's moving, well, unlock the brakes. <laughs> um, propulsion techniques. I think most of the time it's easy to think of bilateral upper extremity. That's the easiest way to think of it. Um, not everybody has both arms that are working. Either they don't exist or, you know, especially if I had a stroke and it's affecting one side of my body. I might have to propel with a foot and an arm or potentially both legs we were talking about earlier. Um, so all of those propulsion techniques, we would want to, again, select the appropriate propulsion technique based on the patient's diagnosis, prognosis, and what they, they can do. Um, really important to teach the... Um, Biomechanics for our, our patients and their caregivers. Again, how do we lower our center of gravity so we can better pro, uh, propel our patients without hurting ourselves? Um, maintain contact with the push handles to turn full on one, push on the other. Uh, the I think starting slowly and stopping slowly is the big one. No sudden movements because we don't want to be watching our patients out of the chair. Be careful of coming around corners and through doorways because you can't see crossing traffic, tell the patient when you're going to tip and how to tip. We've already done ascending and descending curve. Luckily, we've got some good weather on our side today, so we can practice some more of that to make sure we're really proficient at that. Josh, do you find that um, 
eating meals that do propel themselves. Do they end up with more you know, injuries or wounds on their hands? Or have they just sort of mastered it? Definitely a risk, um, but by the time that they're propelling, it's usually not a problem. Initially, there, there can be some, um, but yeah, once they get used to it, there's usually not a problem with hand. Um, slopes can be tough. Depending on the pitch, the leg ringing might come in contact with the ground, so you might have to tip to to navigate around that. You might have to zigzag up and up a slope as well. Um, but always have be careful when tipping the patient. You don't want to be tipping the patient out of the chair. However, you're going to do that. Uh, and then some other independent function. We have to make sure our patients can can have locomotion in a variety of environments. Not only in their home, getting out of their home, curbs, uh, ramps, elevators. What happens if you fall out of the wheelchair? How, first of all, why did we in the first place? What safety steps could we take beforehand? Then how are we going to get back in? Um, when to reach in the wheelchair? Um, the big thing with reaching in the wheelchair that that you you want to make sure that the front casters. If I reach now, I'm at a big risk versus if I have my casters just pointing the other way. What did I now? It's a lot safer for me to reach. Why? I just increased my basis support. So just having the casters, the, the edge of the wheel way far in front increases that stability. That's all it takes to ride the fall out of the chair. Isn't that crazy? Um, so just little things like that, bless you. That one is crucial, I think. All right, um, so that's it for wheelchairs for now. Do we have any questions? What I wanna do for the next half hour, um, I want you to be able to um, Put on and take off the leg ringing, adjusting it within reason. Not everybody, not every wheelchair fits your people. Um, adjust it as appropriately as you can get it. I want you to feel the difference of propelling on a tile floor versus a rug, even just for a little bit. And the high traffic rugs we have are pretty easy to propel on, but it's significantly different than, um, and just think about the softer carpets that exist. And then we can also, Practice the curves, make sure you're proficient out there. So let's let's do this for let's go the next uh, 35 minutes. So 20 pass. We'll do we'll do this until 20 pass. So play with the rigging, make sure you understand all the components, put it on, taking it off, and then propulsion and curves. Okay.